Hello fellow time travellers. It strikes me that in these times we're living through that it's vital to sharpen our brains and keep asking questions about the past. Stay curious uh, about the past, the present and the future. So it's brilliant to have you with me uh, for another journey into our history. Before we get started, I just, I always, I can continuously feel the need to say thank you to everyone who has subscribed to this channel, pressed the button um, and become part of it. So please as well, keep all your brilliant comments coming. You've no idea how much, well, two things, how much they mean to me uh, because of a lot of the emotions expressed and also for the completely mercenary uh, part of the, the equation whereby it gives me ideas so it's feeding, it's feeding the beast. It's, it keeps the whole thing moving. Also, big thanks to everyone who signed up to my Patreon site at patreon.com. Uh, that that financial support, that 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 monthly or annual uh, support, makes the rest of the podcasting and this channel possible. If you're not a member yet and you want to join, go to patreon.com. Search for me by name. That's Neil Oliver. Part with a bit of cash. Uh, follow the yellow brick road sign up and you become a you become a member or better really described as part of the community part of the family and you get access to the, all the stuff that paul and i do every week vodcasts question and answer sessions competitions now and again uh, and just a place uh, a forum in which like-minded free-thinking time travelers can share ideas okay it's now time to strap yourselves into the time machine as we set off on the next step on my love letter to the british isles Cue the music. Magna Carta is a foundation stone of liberal democratic civilization from one end of the planet to the other. The rights, responsibilities and obligations that our ancestors took upon themselves to ensure that we are free people in a free country. In this podcast, we're travelling to see nothing less than the birth of democracy. In a city whose rich history is deeply embedded in the British Isles, there's a castle there holding two documents that have helped shape the world. Born from a power struggle between a battling king and his rebellious barons, they started to pin back the monarchy. Never again would any English monarch have absolute power. Not one, not even a king or queen, is above the law. These documents help lay the foundations for parliamentary democracy, helping to shape the world we live in today. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the British Isles. Hi Neil. Last week we stood with you in the soaring interior of an incredible building that's nearly a thousand years old. Where are we now? Well, we're travelling to another ancient city and we're going to come face to face with an iconic document. Oh, when I say iconic, I mean, it's beyond iconic. The fame of this piece of sheepskin with writing upon it, it reverberates around the world to this day. We're in Lincoln Castle to see Magna Carta. In this time of lockdown, here and around the world, it's worth pausing and thinking about Magna Carta. A Magna Carta, Magna Carta means the big charter, the great charter. It was created in 1215 and it was a, a group of senior noblemen who, who put this thing together and then pretty much insisted that the king, King John, sign it because they were heartily sick and tired of, of what he was up to in terms of behaving as though he was above the law. Even in 1215, or certainly by, by 1215, there, there was the law of the land was there. There were laws that people lived by. But as far as people could tell, whenever it suited them, 
King John just set the law aside and did whatever he wanted. Particularly, it was particularly irksome in relation to taxing the locals, taxing the people, taxing the, the nobles, taxing anybody, gathering money, taking money to finance this, that and the other. And the, the nobles were, were sick and tired of the way in which the king, King John, f- just felt free to do this. And so Magna Carta was put together because this was a, a people saying, not even a king, in fact, is, in some ways, especially the king, isn't above the law. You're answerable at some level. We are here too. Our rights have to be respected. And just because God made you a king doesn't mean that you can run roughshod over everything that we want to do. And I think in these in these troubled times where the government is just telling us moment by moment, every moment of the day, where we can go, what we can do, who we can talk to, how long we can talk to them for, While we go through these times, it's worth all of us remembering ourselves that ancestors hundreds of years ago went to great lengths to ensure freedom, ensure and enshrine rights so that those that govern us don't just get to have it all their own way, that we are here and we are demanding to be listened to. It's beyond entitlement. They have to listen to us. Over a thousand years old, and this document still touches us. We still have links to it, don't we? I have all sorts of connections to Magna Carta. Idiosyncratic connections to it. In 2014, I was in Australia. I was in Canberra. It was in the run-up to 2015, which was the 100th anniversary of the Australians' campaign in Gallipoli, which is their moment. It's like the psalm, the loss of life that their troops endured at Gallipoli fighting against the the Turkish army was a defining moment for many of them to this day. It said something about identity and and who the Australian soldier was, about Australian manhood and and, and Australia's sense of itself as 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 a nation all brought together from disparate parts. Here they were fighting and bleeding and dying at Gallipoli. Uh, So the run up to to the 100th anniversary of that campaign was a big deal and I was there I I was there making a a five part documentary about Gallipoli so I was roaming about Canberra at that point and I I happened to be in the uh, new parliament house so I was there and I was wandering around in a break up in an upper gallery you know up in a a balcony around the main sort of atrium and I was looking in display cases of various treasures and valuable items And to my complete surprise, I found a copy of Magna Carta. It's an unusual copy of Magna Carta, and I can explain why. It was bought for £12,500 in 1952 uh, by a Liberal coalition government in Australia, led at the time by Sir Robert Menzies. And it's one of only four known copies of what's called the Inspeximus issue of Magna Carta, and it was made in 1297. Magna Carta was was rewritten and modified almost right away. King John signed a copy of it in 1215. He was almost frog-marched to Runnymede Green, a, a water meadow on the banks of the Thames in 1215, and he had to sign this thing. And right away, he complained to the Pope and said, you know, big boys made me sign this and I didn't want to, and... He got himself sort of absolved of all responsibility and it was null and void. But but subsequently, other copies of it were drafted, slightly modified. So here's another version of Magna Carta from 1297, long after the time of King John, and bearing the seal of Edward I, Edward Longshanks, Edward that gets into all sorts of trouble fighting William Wallace and all the rest of it, Scottish Wars of Independence, that Edward I. So it's one of only four. The one that the Australian government acquired in 1952 is one of only four of that uh, Inspeximus issue. Of the other three, two are in London uh, and one is on display in the National Archives in Washington, D.C. And the Canberra copy, the one that the Australians have, is the only copy of Magna Carta of any form in the Southern Hemisphere. So it was so bizarre to stumble across it, you know, because you think of it as quintessentially quintessentially British Magna Carta and to see it 
on display, hallowed, valued, treated with the greatest of respect in Australia was quite significant. But it all just goes to underline what an incredible document Magna Carta is. Because it enshrined, in a way that no other document previously had, this idea that not even the king is above the law. It's about three and a half thousand words long. It's just lots, it's like bullet points. And this, and this, and then this, and this. It's just a long list of rights and demands and statements making clear what the relationship is between the people and the king. Uh, and by now, everything's been pretty much made out of date by subsequent legal writ. Magna Carta is essentially out of date. It's a redundant document in any legal sense. Beyond really, I mean, there is a, one of the clauses says that you can't be imprisoned without trial. There's this idea enshrined within Magna Carta that the, the king can't just, or the government can't just throw you in a cell. You know, there has to be due process. You can only be imprisoned subject to, or, or, or ultimately leading to a trial by your peers and all the rest of it. You know, that's, that's all enshrined there. It's seen as the beginning of democracy, in a way, parliamentary democracy, isn't it? It's a step along the way. It, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a step along the way. Basically, just once and for all, it kind of put a choke chain around the monarch and said, you're not above the law. Don't get above yourself because we can, we can, we can tug on this chain and, and pull you down. So, I mean, that's, that, so that's the copy of the, the Magna Carta bonus edition a copy of which exists in Canberra, but one of the reasons to go and see Magna Carta in, in Lincoln Castle is it's because it's a contemporary copy of the original. I mean, obviously, there was a, a 1215 copy of Magna Carta all written out. It wasn't on paper, it was on sheepskin, uh, and it was signed, that one was signed by King John. But, of course, there had to be copies that were sent around the kingdom the copy that's in Lincoln Castle was the copy that was sent to Lincoln at the time. The Bishop of Lincoln was a signatory. You know, he, he had countersigned the document. And so then a, a copy of this thing was sent to, to Lincoln to be stored there. And copies of Magna Carta were sent to principal towns and cities around the realm, you know, so that everyone had access to one. And it's now, I mean, Magna Carta, it's, everyone's heard of it even if they don't particularly maybe necessarily know what it is. I mean, I remember being at primary school and learning a little nursery rhyme about it. Bad Prince John was a right royal tartar till he made his mark on Magna Carta. Ink seal table on Runnymede Green, Anno Domini 1215. It used to be one of those things that was so important that kids were taught about it in something they could remember. You know, it was one of those things that was deemed so uh, important that if you don't remember much else, pay attention to this moments and thoughts and ideas that are of fundamental and profound significance to the realm and to the people, they find their way into things like rhymes so that everyone can remember. And another reason to go and see Magna Carta at uh, Lincoln Castle is because it's displayed alongside the Charter of the Forest, which is another document signed in 1217. Now, King John signed the Magna Carta, or the original, in 1215, and right away went crying to the Pope, saying he was bullied into doing this. And it was null and void almost from, almost from the word go. Uh, but King John died in 1216, and he was succeeded by Henry III, his son. And Henry III brought the Magna Carta back, accepted that it was right and proper that he put his signature to a grand charter, making clear the relationship between the monarch and the, and the people. So he reissued it. And at the same time, he signed the Charter of the Forest, which in many ways is just as significant because up until that point, up until the signing of the Charter of the Forest, the poor people, which is to say people like you and me, we weren't allowed in the forests of the realm. They were for the king. That was his hunting territory. But the people needed into the forest. Apart from anything else, they wanted to be able to collect wood. You know, wood for, wood for building, wood for burning. They needed access. So the Charter of the Forest made it law, made it legal, that the ordinary people, the rank and file, also had certain rights when it came to the forests. So if you go to Lincoln Castle now, both Magna Carta 1215 and 
the Charter of the Forest, 1217, are, are there on display. So Magna Carta was primarily about the rights and laws concerning the nobility. Well, yeah, it is. I mean, to be honest, the people, the barons and the nobility that brought the king to sign Magna Carta, they didn't really give a tinker's cuss about the ordinary people any more than the king did. Any kind of notion that it's about the people and the king, not really. It, it's, it's pretty much making sure that other powerful people in the country have their rights respected. But, but that said, it, it enshrined the basic notion you, it was a, that's why it's a, it was a step along the way to making sure that the king and his subjects had a relationship and just as the, the subjects weren't above the law, neither was the king. It's almost a transcendental concept in a way. It's the idea that the king accepts that power is not actually his forever. Power is, is separate exists in its own right. In the concept of our kings and queens down through the centuries, the idea was that the, the king was given his power by God. But nonetheless, power was, was separate from the monarch. And it settled on the monarch's shoulders, in a sense, when he or she took the throne. It settled on their shoulders like a kind of a, a mantle or a yoke. And for as long as they lived then, the power was there. But in the moment that they died, you know, the king is dead, long live the king. The power magically relocated from the dead king or queen to the successor. So there was this idea that Magna Carta was putting it in black and white, that just because power was with you, it wasn't yours forever. You know, it, it wasn't something you were going to be able to take into your grave with you. It had settled on you. You'd been blessed with power. And then in due course, power would move to the next person. So there was some of that transcendental, ethereal concept within Magna Carta. You have power, but it's a gift. And it won't always be with you. And when your time is up, the power will move on again. But, but power exists independently of any any king, any emperor. Why did Henry, of his own volition, resurrect Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest? Because they needed there was a they had to be they had to be political. There was an extent to which they had to keep the kingdom running. And do you want civil war? You know, do you want to go to war against your barons and your nobles? Do you want to fight? And some of them did. I mean that that happened again and again and again. But there were other ways of handling things. And you might say, well, there are concessions that might be made. And, and in the context of Magna Carta, King John, you know, signed it, then nullified it. But then Henry III, his son, he was more inclined to honour the concept of it. But Magna Carta echoed around the world. Magna Carta, it's signed in 1215, but its significance rattled around the world. The American Declaration of Independence wouldn't have taken the form that it did had it not been preceded by the thinking of Magna Carta. It had that effect. It's there in, I mean, it's there in Canberra, New Parliament House, in what is a, you know, a relatively new country. But its constitution and, and the rights of its people are expressed and shaped and formed in the way that they are because people could refer back to a document that was written in 1215. So 1215 and Magna Carta and that idea, it fossilised. It became something permanent that our Western liberal democracies never forgot. Once the monarch had that reality expressed to him, that idea never went away again. And even though we're beyond the time of kings and queens, we still remember the idea of Magna Carta, which is to say, and that's why it's relevant now, at a time of lockdown, and, and, and in amongst all this upheaval and upset, that those that govern us, they don't have absolute power. They have that power because we let them have it. And when the day and hour comes when they are not 
respecting and properly living up to the responsibility of that power that we have granted them, then it's our obligation as the population to take it away from them. Which is what happens at an election. If you're not satisfied, if you haven't been properly ruled, then the majority of the population have, have, the, have the right and, and indeed the obligation to get up on their hind legs and say, this isn't good enough. You've had your shot on your way because we'll find somebody better. You know, we'll come to the declaration of our growth in due course, which was a, which was a letter that was written to the Pope on behalf of Robert the Bruce. But it was saying much the same thing that was there in Magna Carta. Well, in as much as it was saying, we make Robert the Bruce our king. And as long as he's a good king, we will f f fight to the death for him. But if he lets us down and turns out to be a rubbish king, we would have no hesitation in knocking him off the throne and replacing him with somebody else, somebody better. These are fundamental tenets of our civilization. You might not have the declaration of our broth, which was written in 1320, if it hadn't been for Magna Carta a hundred years before, where people had the, the nerve to get up in the face of a monarch and say, I'm going to tell you how it's going to be. <laughs> this is how it is. Now you sign this. Because this is a relationship, and if you let us down, there are consequences, you know. And that's why, and that's why these, that's why the ideas that are enshrined in Magna Carta all that time ago, and enshrined in subsequent documents, it's beholden. It's the obligation of every generation of the population to remember that we have rights and we are free, and that it's not up to any government or any individual to take our rights away from us. They are ours. And if they let us down, and if they don't protect our liberties, it's not just our right, it's our obligation to remind them. Having it written down there in black and white in a document, is that what made it so effective? This is the, yes, I mean, if you, it, it, it's why writing is so important. When Christianity was coming into the British Isles, something that made it appealing to kings was the fact that they could get things written down. Here are my laws, write them down and, and circulate this about my kingdom. Once you can write, once you have the written word, that's powerful. Because something that's said, maybe just amongst 10 people or amongst two people, who's going to believe that it was, when it's repeated later on, the king, the king has just said, such and such. Oh, did he? I wasn't. I wasn't in the room. Prove it. Prove he said that. <laughs> you know. Where, whereas if you've got it written down, yeah. you know, put it in writing. That's important, and it cuts both ways. If you can get an agreement, a contract. Magna Carta is a contract, and once you've got a contract written down, you can show it to other people. See, look, this is the deal. These are the rules that we live by. This is the nature of the relationship. This is our contract, and if either side welches on it. There's consequences if you, if you breach a contract, you know, and this is why it matters. And you go to, you go to Lincoln's, Lincoln's a fantastic place to go and see it. Lincoln Castle is a fantastic castle to go and see it. And Lincoln's got a long uh, history in and of itself. It was established by Romans during the time of the, the, the Roman occupation. It was called Lindum Colonia, which is to say the colony at Lindum. And Lindum means the black pool or the dark pool. It's the same in essence, as um, Dublin. Dublin means the Black Pool. So Lindum, the colony at Lindum was the colony at the Black Pool, and it refers to a widening of the River Witham at Lincoln. And it's, a, it's dark, the water's dark, possibly because the, there's a hill above it that casts into shadow, you know, possibly because peaty soil, you know, turns the water dark, but it's the colony beside the Dark Pool. And it, it had been established by the Romans at a place where the Foss Way... And Ermine Street, it came together. And the Fossway and Ermine Street were two roads that the Romans built to let them move people and, and materials around the province. Uh, and so they, they garrisoned, they put people at Lincoln because it was an important junction on those two roads. And subsequently it became a colony town, which was where after legionnaires, after Roman soldiers had served their time, had done their years of service, they would retire. And they would go and take up some land and have a and have a home and live out their retirement at a place like Lincoln. So that's what that's what Lincoln became. After the Romans were gone, it was colonised by Vikings. With the Romans gone, it had become a bit of a backwater. Then the, the Vikings came in. They established a 
a settlement there. And then in 1066, William the Conqueror, you know, after the Battle of Hastings, he comes in and he builds the castle. So the castle that's there at Lincoln was established by William the Conqueror in the aftermath of 1066. I mean, Lincoln's just a, a brilliant place. The cathedral in Lincoln, the central tower, which was completed in 1311, was for a long time the tallest structure in the world. And it was the first structure in the world that was taller than the Great Pyramid at Giza. Up until the building of the addition of the tower on top of the cathedral at Lincoln in 1311, no man-made structure on earth had been as tall as the Great Pyramid at, at Giza. But the tower at Lincoln beat it, and it was the tallest building in the world then until 1549 when it fell over in a storm. But it, but it, had, had, this, um, but it had, had this period of supremacy as a, as, a, as a structure. Lincoln Castle is one of those castles that looks like a castle. If, if you were a, if a small boy like me that had a toy castle that you could put toy soldiers on round the battlements and have mock battles and mock sieges, Lincoln Castle looks like that, <laughs> except big. You know, it's got that, you can stand inside it and the small boy in you resurfaces and you think, oh yeah, I could play here. It's got that look about it. And then, just to make it even more thought-provoking, it has these two unbelievably important documents, Magna Carta from 1215 and the Charter of the Forest of 1217 have within them, enshrined within them, incredibly important steps along the way to making us free people, people with rights, people that couldn't just be stamped upon by an, an over-ambitious monarch or an over-ambitious ruler. And at all times, it's worth remembering that the ancestors hundreds of years ago took the trouble to write things down and get the rulers to sign them because it's a line in the sand that says here and no further and you do not want to at any time it's beyond want we have no right to surrender the rights, responsibilities and obligations that our ancestors took upon themselves to ensure that we are free people in a free country. It's amazing, isn't it, that documents like this, which are over a thousand years old, still have something useful to tell us. Yeah, you can't, that's why you can't take things for granted. Just because you've grown up believing yourself to be free, believing that you live in a, a, a liberal democracy, that one person, one vote, the rule of law, the protection of private property. These things are good, and these things have been the building blocks for the kind of society that we have lived in and the, and the kind of society and civilization that the other societies and civilizations around the world have, have envied and have sought to emulate. But it's like the woodwork around your windows. It has to be maintained all the time. The rotten wood has to be dug out and replaced. The putty has to be renewed. It's got to be kept painted. The structure of the house has to be maintained. The roof won't remain watertight without attention. And, and things happen. And so at a, at, at a time like this, it, it's as though we've been reminded, oh, look, water's come in, there's a leak. Why is that? Oh, well, we, possibly we haven't paid enough attention to the roof. And so there are these reminders that come along that tell us, oh, this stuff isn't just here by accident. This stuff is the product of effort and it's our obligation to keep an eye on it and maintain it. And when bits of it start to fail, oh, you renew them. That's the point. It's a continual process of maintenance and renewal that keeps the big house we all live in wind and watertight and safe for all of us in it. Freedom and liberty, they're not some kind of magic gift. They are the product of effort and sacrifice. And every now and again, they have to be repainted, renewed, made fit for purpose, so that they'll last out another few generations. That's the deal. And Magna Carta is a monument to remind us of that fact. place apart, 
a small island at the centre of this archipelago. An ancient three-legged motif, its own laws and parliament, stubborn independence at the heart of the British Isles, and a view to remember. Next time, in my love letter to the British Isles. Check out Neil Oliver Love Letter, the podcast's Instagram account. And to ensure you get each new episode of the podcast as it goes live, don't forget to subscribe, write a review and share with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. Social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucy and Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles Such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production.